Okay, welcome everybody to this new seminar of the Advanced Computing and Machine Learning thematic area. Thank you very much uh, for coming today. It's a real pleasure to have Patricio Clark de Leoni um, today uh, from the Universidad de San Andres in Argentina. Uh, it's really uh, quite some nice activities that he's doing in his group uh, and that we will actually get quite a nice, uh, quite a nice uh, overview today. Uh, the main activity will be on reconstruction and preparation of turbulent states. So, uh, Patricio, uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's get started. If anyone has any questions at any point, please feel free to stop me and uh, answer. We don't have to wait until the end. So, yeah, let's go. So, as I said, the main focus of the talk is going to be how to, out of measurements, reconstruct the turbulent flow. And what's the, the deal with turbulent flow? We know they are they're complex, they're nonlinear, they are multi-scale, they, so they have multiple scales both in, in space and time. We can never measure every scale, we can never measure every component. Uh, sometimes we can measure the velocity components, we cannot measure, for example, pressure or temperature or vice versa. And the idea is going to be in different scenarios, how we can take this, uh, how we can reconstruct higher following more uh, modern machine learning tools or using some more classical data simulation uh, problems. Uh, so, the, so the menu today, we're gonna first start with the first three topics are going to be on reconstruction, going from a very much equation informed uh, classical way with nudging, then going to, uh, we're gonna be using neural, neural networks, but without like really physics blind, we're gonna forget about our knowledge of physics and just use OS, except for the setup the problem, of course, but not in the architecture itself. And then we're gonna reincorporate physics through physics informed neural networks. And in the end, I'm going to show not really how to reconstruct the flow. So if I have a merchant, how to like get the whole picture, but how to prepare or generate a flow that follows certain observations. And in all cases, it's going to be fully developed turbulence in different levels of uh, development and Reynolds number, but it's going to be a uh, multi-scale flow, certainly quite turbulent. So let's start like right off the bat with the first uh, method. As I said, the idea here is, and in this service, uh, a way to summarize what we're going to be doing throughout the whole talk, which is, We'll have some reference data. This is a simulation of a homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. So you can see, as I was saying, lots of different scales, like small things, a large scale as well. And this is all, this is 3D and it's evolving time. And the idea is that out of that reference data, that in which case as I'm gonna be first talking about synthetic experiments. So every time I refer to a reference or the truth, I know exactly what's going on because we run the first simulation there. Uh, out of that data, we'll get some measurements. And we want to then, yeah, try to infer the whole. So in this first method, as I was saying, it's called nudging. And the idea is very much coming from the um, synchronization or dynamical systems world, where we want to take this data, these measurements that we have, and that are coming from a simulation of the Navier-Stokes equations, and then uh, notch or basically add a penalty term to the equations we want to solve that will make the, the evolved system be, try to stay close to the given data. So we have our reference data, and we have the field we want to evolve. This is the field we're going to be using for deep reconstruction. So by evolving the equations with this term, the field will try to be close to the reference field. So it's really like a sort of a synchronization or a penalty term. And here what we have is in blacks, the energy of the reference flow. So this is the time evolution of the energy of this flow. And these two other lines are the energy coming from nudge stimulation that first start from zero because the initial condition is like the, the fluid's not moving. But once I start adding energy through this penalty term, the system eventually starts to indeed synchronize and follow the dynamic of the reference field. And the difference between the two lines is how much information I'm, I'm using. So the volume fraction of how my, my measurements are covering my whole field. 
and I forgot to say the, that in this uh, penalty term, this I is a spatial operator, uh, a filter operator can be uh, can be spatial. So, for example, if I have measurements here, this operator only acts where I have measurements in space. So it's like a, some Dirac deltas. Uh, to put it one way, or if I'm working in spectral space, it will be a low pass filter. So it's, if I only have information on some Fourier scales of the problem, I only act on the scales where I have information. I only act on the points where I have information. On the rest, it's just plain old Navier Stokes equation. And the thing I'm missing from the <clears throat> Nash equation as well, as well is the, um, the forcing term of the fluid flow that generated this. Uh, uh, the, the original reference field. Um, <clears throat> so what we see here are different, uh, and as I was saying, we can do this in spectral or in configuration space. Uh, what I'm here showing are the spectral cases because in configuration space, one can basically just take the mean distance and do one over the mean distance and the results to extrapolate quite well. By this, we want to as turbulence is a multi-scale phenomenon. We want to understand when, if, if I give information on some scales, we were like, okay, if I give information on the large scales of the system through this uh, through this term, we knew that probably the equations were going to synchronize over on those scales. But what happens the, to the other scales of the system? Will they get filled up? Will they get filled up in what way? And what we have over here is the energy spectra. Uh, so here in the yeah, purple line is the spectra of the reference field that we have over here, the reference data. We can see all the different scales in the system. So that was a big simulation. And what we have all these lines here are the spectra coming from the Nash simulation that we can see it was indeed synchronizing already. We can see in which scales it, is it synchronizing. So we are here is the spectra of the Nash simulation when it's Nash up to the wave number marked here in the different like gray uh, shaded areas. So the one here in blue is Nash only up to this wave number. So it's really just the largest scales of the system. And then so forth is the, the next one and the next one. And we show here is the spectra of the difference of the two fields. So sorry, of the difference of the two fields. So we can see the errors in the larger scales are small, while the errors in the scales that we are not nudging are quite big. So we can see, indeed, we can synchronize the, the scales where we have information, but not so much the other ones, except until we start giving a lot of information. So at some point, we don't have to go all the way to the end of the spectrum. Once we reach the crossover where the, the nonlinear energy flux is matched by the dissipation, then the rest of the scales of the system are completely slaved. So once we notch all the way up to here, the rest of the scale, the, the, those scales don't have any freedom, dynamically speaking. They can, they just, they just follow what the larger scales are doing because they cover all, almost all of the inertial range. So it's important to bear in mind here that um, the this is a linear log scale, but in three D, these are actually a lot of modes that I'm not using. So because this is just the, the shell of in the 3D space in so this area is really quite big because it's just the, the shell of the of the 3D sphere. And similar, we can show over here are the, the errors, the large or the large scale correlation and the small scale correlations. So yeah, the, the solid lines are the large scale correlation and the, the blank markers, small scale correlations are the correlations of vorticity. And we can see that the, uh, the, the more we nudge, the, the errors on the large scale quickly saturate, while the errors in the small scale correlation do take a while to fill up the information. So what we have here is a, a method then that we can reconstruct large scales, but we'll fill in all the small scales, because we can see there are quite a bit of small scales, fill it in, in a, like with dynamics that are compatible with the large scales, but not, are, are not exactly those that are that happen in the truth in the reference data, unless we just use really a lot of information. Uh, and as a, this method is very much uh, physics informed because I'm just I'm using the equations of motion. I may be missing some terms, and that's indeed what I want to go ahead of now. In the 
in the original equations, I had a, a forcing term, which I do not have in the uh, in the Nash equations. So at some point we ask ourselves, okay, the method works. We can synchronize turbulent flows. But what happens, uh, we know we're missing some terms. We could be missing it here, it could be the, a forcing term, or could be missing other terms, say like a rotation, a Coriolis force term, like rotation. How will that synchronization, how will that reconstruction depend on how well I choose my parameters for those that missing or that term I may like, I may think it's there, but I don't know really the, the exact, uh, it's amplitude, it's strength or whatever. So what we check is we run again, these different experiments change in the um, adding, for example, in the case of a rotation flow, a Coriolis term that have different rotation, rotation rates as the, as the actual reference field. So we have two different flow, flows rotating at different speeds and we're trying to reconstruct one with the other. Um, what we realize is that one, nudging is able to sort of make up for the last effect of not having the correct rotation rate because the errors are, these are the errors and the scales where I reconstruct are not that uh, are okay, but if I indeed use the correct terms, if I indeed match the rotation, the rotation rate of the nudged and the reference field, they will, uh, the, the errors will be much better, especially on the scales where I'm supplying information. So checking here in the scales where I already know what, what's going on. But basically what we have here is then a way to fit or be say, show sensitivity of the system to the parameters of the underlying data. So the better the, my parameters are, the better the reconstruction is. Um, we can use this idea, for example, to fit, uh, uh, fit the coefficients of a sub scale model and so on. But it's a way like we, we can ask questions to the system itself by uh, tuning parameters and data. So this was the, um, the first method I was showing I jumped like, right into it. Uh, now we'll go to, as I said, the next one on the list was, uh, we're going to be a neural network based approach for a different kind of reconstruction problem. So now, until now we had data that was resolved in time and space, maybe was sparse, but was resolved in time and space. And now we, we changed the, the approach. We said, okay, now imagine we only have uh, images of data that are for some reason we are missing uh, some information. Where the, the scenario we're envisioning is you have a satellite image with a, say a cloud on top. And so we are missing a part of the field. So we don't have a completely, we don't have volume results. So here is a, it's just a 2D snapshot of a flow that indeed was a 3D. And we don't have temporal information. So we only have the image. So, and the, the thing is, can all the uh, neural network and generative adversarial network approaches used for impre filling in images can be used for turbulent data. So instead of just, you have a normal problem of, you have a picture of someone, someone's face and it's missing like you know, the nose and the algorithms are able to like put the nose back in. Okay, they can do it with noses. But can they do it with turbulent data, which has particular correlations, particular scaling that we've the, the statistics of the the statistical questions we can ask to the uh, data are much more precise than the statistical questions we can ask on a nose. So that's what we set up to do. So we we'll grab data from, uh, as I said, it was a three D rotating flow again, and we uh, use data snapshots uh, that are parallel to the rotation axis. So as we can see, we can see all this formation of vortices. We have these columns and we cut them and we shall see like the big vortices. And we'll take, we'll remove information from the data that can be as big as the largest scale of the system. So bigger than these vortices or much smaller. So smaller than the uh, structures we can uh, observe in the flow. And as I was saying, we're gonna be using generative adversarial networks to tackle this problem. So we'll have, a, as inputs, this damaged uh, data. So yeah, the cloud covered satellite data would be in our case. That's an input to an encoder that tries to inc uh, encode and decode and uh, output the missing region. So in total input and the output, the sum of that would be the, the total image that we want to have. 
and that's done through so and the decoder what it gives us here is that yeah that missing region over there and the part that makes it so not only we'll have a in our loss we'll train for as we have the as we have the reference data we'll have the um, we know what the actual truth is we're not what should be inside of that region so we'll train by uh, using just a reconstruction L2 norm, we'll take that data, we'll take the what should be inside there, we'll take what the network is outputting and just compare the two via an L2 norm, that's over here, that reconstruction loss. But being adversarial, we'll also add uh, an adversarial loss to the system. So there will be a second, uh, beside the generator, there will be another adversarial discriminator, which will take both the uh, missing the original data or the generated data and try to differentiate between the two, discriminate between what's true and the true and what's the fake images we're generating. So it adds a bit of like the, uh, the problem we hold here, so that this min max problem, you want to minimize the reconstruction loss, but at some point maximize this discrimination loss where you're fooling the other network. The network that learned that first learned how to discriminate between the two parts. And we'll see in a bit why this is important for this problem, because you get asked, hey, you can only do this the same thing with just a reconstruction loss and just have like fit that L2 norm and get those uh, velocity fields at the end. But we'll see that this adversarial loss does uh, in a, an important component. Even though it's small, as you can see, the, the hyperparameters here, like it's just uh, like a very small fraction, but um, it will come in, it will be important. So over here we see uh, the adversarial loss is uh, this line over here with the uh, circle markers and with the square markers is a reconstruction loss. And as I was saying, first the system, the problem must have to differentiate between what's fake and what's not. And at some point starts, at the same time starts to reconstruct the actual flow was going on again. But uh, once it learns to discriminate, it at some point it cannot do it anymore very well. And then because the reconstruction start being so good that the neural the network cannot differentiate what between what's real and what's not. And we can see that at first it first tries to match these big blobs and then starts to get some structure. And the end the, the structures generated by the data are quite uh, detailed. But again, what's important so we can see that if we just look at the reconstruction, we say, okay, that's it does make, uh, make sense. I will put in there a blob of vorticity that uh, in the, there seem to be some traces of it there. So we're just outputting that blob of vertice there. Um, we, we take a look at it and it looks fine. But if we take a, um, we actually compare this generated field with the real one, with the actual like one that happened for that, uh, for that contour, and we can see they are not the same, and the errors actually can get up to like almost twenty percent error. So there is some match. There is some of the scales are being matched, really like the bigger scales are matched. So the algorithm know that there's a blob of vertices there, but of course, I mean the um, here the hole is so big that there's so, there are so many scales in there that are not determined by what's happening outside. So what's going on inside is just being filled up by the. Um, by the network, similar to what was happening with the nudging that I was showing before, that the algorithm must reconstruct the smaller scales with something that is compatible with what's seen, but it may not be exactly what's happening. That's, that, that's why we get up some errors in here. But what's important is that the reconstruction itself of what's going on, if we uh, is statistically consistent with what's supposed to be output by the neighbor stokes equation because we take a look at the distributions of vorticity the pdfs and the structure functions of the data so we take this uh, this field and just do the statistics of it so compare the, yeah, the, the how turbulent it is or not so even though we may have a deterministic point by point error the statistics of the field are well reconstructed so the network learns how to fill in scales that may not be exactly what happened, but at least are consistent with the dynamics observed in the training data set. Um, this is why then the adversarial part is so important. If we had only trained with a reconstruction loss, the big scales of the system would have been okay because it's an L2 norm and you have a lot of energy in the bigger scales. The, so maybe the, the big blobs, as we can see here, the big blobs would have been 
filled in. But what happens is that if you only had a reconstruction loss, and I was trying to show in these pictures, you can see they're very smooth out. They're very smooth. It puts the vortex there. The big blob is there. The, uh, that the tornado is there. That is completely smooth. And the adversarial network realizes that in order to fool the adversary, in order to be able to be similar to the truth, not only has to have that big blob in there, it has to start adding all these, uh, all the smaller scales, all the features we are seeing here, it has to learn how to add them in order to fool the adversarial network. And indeed in doing that, it is filling them and not just any way, not just adding random small scales noise, it has to add it in a way that's statistically compatible with what's seen. So, so this is it for, oh no, there's an R side here. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I just realized there was a, I was translate, translating this uh, slides earlier and I missed the word. So just it's a turbulence. <laughs> so the other question we ask ourselves is okay, we have data in this case, we're training always with the, the snapshots of the velocity field. It's always important to know, okay, if you have more data, how will you improve your results and how do you use more data? Uh, so we change the objective a bit and instead of just reconstructing the energy, uh, sorry, the uh, the velocity field, we say, okay, let's reconstruct the vorticity. The, and the vorticity fields are have much uh, stronger constant on the small scale, so like the small scales are way more important and their statistics are uh, not Gaussian. Like in velocity fields are usually quite Gaussian in, in turbulent flows, while uh, vorticity fields that we can see over here are not. They are like very long tail. They, they are quite uh, nasty to put it on way. So to see how the algorithm first reacted to where not normal data and normal and not normally distributed data, and how the different components we can use of the information uh, will impact the reconstruction. So we thought, okay, we want to get the vorticity. We can do that by either training an network to output the velocity field in the three components, as we were doing before, and just calculating the vorticity after that. So that was it. We had as inputs, as in input data and output data, sorry, the velocity field in three components. When we generated that, we can see that the it learns how to reconstruct something, the original and generated one, but uh, the result, the errors are much bigger than before. Previously, we had errors that are smaller than 20% when reconstructing the velocity. Now for vorticity, it's order 50%. So clearly it was something that this approach wasn't working quite well now. Then we said, okay, if we have the information on the vorticity, let's just use that. Instead of trying to go through the velocity, work with vorticity itself. So it's just an error that tries to output vorticity. It gets this field as the input and gets as it has to output this uh, missing region. And it's worse. So instead, uh, so we, we got the the objective of the, the target of the network closer to our intended target, reconstructing vorticity, and it's worse using the vorticity itself directly that training with the velocity fields. And remember, for the get the vorticity out of this, we have to do, take the curl. So it's an operation that if the fields are not uh, well um, well generated, those derivatives are going to be have a lot of errors. So it doesn't, it's not a nice operation to do, but it seems to be better to doing that than going through vorticity itself. And the problem is that, is what I was saying before, these distributions are just it's super long tail, they are not nice, and the networks don't really like, that's at least from our understanding, they were not very keen on outputting that directly. They prefer to be working with the more normally distributed velocity fields than directly with the vorticity in this case. But we said, okay, if we had the information on vorticity, and we know that it's better to train velocity, let's try to add that information somehow. And we add it not now by in the output, so we're still in, the, in this third case, we're still outputting velocity, but we said, okay, in the reconstruction loss, we'll have a reconstruction uh, term for the velocity field and one for the vorticity field. So we're only using the information in the loss function, not in the output of the network itself. And that's what outputted the best results of all. So he, uh, that reconstruction law was added through a Sobel filter to calculate the, uh, the curve, similar to what we do here. Uh, so I did that um, constraint uh, on the on the derivatives of the, network of the output on the vortex itself, but working with the normally distributed uh, velocity fields, we can get the best of the results. 
So in the, yeah, the moral, uh, the story then it's no matter, it's important what information you use and also how you use it. Because in this case, a bit counterintuitive at first, but using it just in the outputting velocity and using the for this information in the loss function was a better approach. Okay, okay, we're halfway through with two out of the four uh, uh, problems I wanted to share. And now, as I was saying, we started with the equation, very strongly equation heavy problem of nudging. We removed the equations with uh, and guns, but we added some idea of our physics again when looking at that vorticity losses I was just discussing. And now we're going to, yeah, do go add even more physics to a neural network approach, but a neural network approach is quite different from a gun, and this this uh, physics informed neural networks. Uh, which these are networks that are designed to approximate uh, solutions of PDEs. So we have uh, functions here, it can be the velocity and the pressure field, and they are just functions of position and time, the normal functions we always work on. And they have, we approximate these functions by a neural network. So far, nothing, uh, nothing new, but what we'll add, the physics in form we're going to be adding is that as we have this function and we can take derivatives of these functions and build our residuals of the, of the equations of motion, and we know that these functions have to satisfy a, a given equation of motion, we can inform the training of these neural networks by adding not, not only a, a loss that depends on data, we can be like here velocity data, so we have a normal typical regression done with a, a, with a neural network. We'll add the residuals of the equations of motion to the training. So the output of the network that function is trying to learn, not only is trying to be close to some data, it's going to try to be close to the manifold of solutions of the Neuerstock's equation. So it's a, a regularization term that's coming from not the, that's not looking at the ways of the network, it's a regularization term that looks at the output of the network and uh, it's coming through the physics. Um, that physics is calculated not via finite differences or something, it's calculated via automatic differentiation on the network. So the same thing we do to get the gradients of the loss function and train a neural network, it's just the same procedure. Instead of uh, taking the derivative with respect to a uh, weight of the network, we take the derivative with respect to the inputs of the network. And that way we can build up any differential equation we want. And why pins have been used on a variety of uh, equations of all sorts. Here we'll use them for the Niger equation. So we take the derivative with respect to t, to x, and to x two times, and so on. They've been used, uh, pins been used for reconstruction purposes. Uh, it's one of their like, almost like main, uh, they've been used either for to, to solve equations of motion, to solve PDEs, or to uh, work with inverse problems of this sort, where you have some measurements and you want to infer the, the uh, the whole state of the solution. So that the reconstruction problem I was mentioning before. Uh, so for example, they were used for PAB reconstruction to get the whole ve velocity field uh, out of uh, snapshots of a uh, PAB. And I know that, uh, Ricardo told me there were some uh, solids people in the area. We also used uh, pins to recon uh, characterize tracks um, uh, on a metal sheet. So we had a metal sheet and some um, waves going on top and we use a wave equation and pins to get the, and they had a crack to get the shape of the crack just by looking at where the speed of sound on the, uh, on the metal sheets was zero. So they can be used for inverse problem. They are quite useful for inverse problem pins. And the problem we set out to, to work on was reconstruct the flow, especially reconstruct the pressure out of a particle tracking experiment. So we had particle tracking data where we had a turbulent flow, we track particles and we get their positions in time and space. And we're going to want to know the velocity field that's coming from that, uh, those measurements, that in a way that's almost, if you have all the track information resulting in time and space, it's basically doing an interpolation of that or interpolation or regression of that data. We can get better, better worse results, but the data, the information is there. It's similar to what we were doing before. We have data, and we want to get the whole velocity field. But what we also wanted to do was to get the pressure. 
normally what people would do is first get the velocity field and then write a Poisson equation for the pressure and try to solve that. But that's approach we uh, people know doing this know it's very error prone. Uh, it propagates any errors you have. Getting the uh, calculating the relatives of the um, that very nice data can be hard, and they know that they lead to a lot of errors. So I say, okay, can we do it with pins? So first we started with synthetic data. I promise there was going to be a slide on experimental data as well. But first we wanted to see if the the method worked properly. We want to take a problem where we knew what the result was. We knew the truth. And so in this case, we grab data from a turbulent channel flow. So we have here our truth, both the velocity and the pressure data. And we did, um, sorry. We compared against a method that the, the people running the experiments are, were already, already have, which is a, a, consists of interpolating the velocity and doing line integrations of the pressure to get the pressure. So this is what they were having, they were working on, and say, okay, let's do it with the pins here. And this is first, the first uh, result with pins. So we have, this is our truth, this is the, the state of the art, and we can see that with means we can get pretty good in the, the velocity field very much look the same both ways. But the pressure is uh, considerably smoother than one coming from pins and one coming from the other method. Because I was saying pins have regularization in two ways. One, neural networks tend to regularize data and to smooth out data sometimes. So studying that and having that equation and force term really smooth out problems. So we can see this, this is a very qualitative, just to show you indeed what kind of fields we are putting. They are 3D. They are they also evolve in time. These are, as we, we have a track data, so they evolve in time. This is just a snapshot of an evolution in time. The flow is actually several flow through, so there's a lot of fluid going through. We can also look at this a bit more quantitative. Yeah. So we look at the errors in pressure reconstruction with comparing all of the synthetic data and doing two things. One is changing the particle spacing, and one is changing the noise. Uh, so we add some noise to the data. As we have the original data, we can just corrupt it as, at will. And the three columns are three different positions away from the wall. So this is very close to the wall. This is uh, in the middle of the, our reconstruction domain. And this is very close to the top of our reconstruction domain. So it's not that close to the, to the uh, center of the channel, but it's, it's just uh, our volume was, where it's smaller. And we can see that both for the particle spacing and especially for the noise, pins are uh, the error in the pins compared to the error in the previous method. We had, you know, then it was a little, the one they were very happy with. Uh, uh, it's, I think errors increase, increase by when added the, making the uh, observation sparser, but they don't increase as uh, fast. And especially when making the data more correct, when we add more, more uh, noise to our data. So it's harder to perform the initial interpolation. And the pins stay quite robust. So really adding that Navier-Stokes inform the term, will be able to weed out all the noise that's really not a turbulent noise. It's just, it can differentiate between what's uh, separate the width from the hay. So, so. And as I was saying about the smoothing, the, the results, we could just by taking a look at the field, the, the output on the pins was much smoother than the one coming from the R method. Or we can see here, if just like a, take a cut, a streamwise velocity profile, that the, the L2 error between the DNS of the truth, the, the R method, and the pins are also quite similar because in those, uh, on those points, all three lines are very close to each other. But of course, if you look at the errors in the gradients and the relative of the, um, of the outputs, then the pins perform do a much better job because they are able to really smooth out the, the fields and get a, so we regularize on the derivatives, we get a better prediction on the derivatives as well. And we also get a very good reconstruction of the pressure spectra. Uh, this is the time resolved pressure spectra, and we can all throughout the inertial range, we can reconstruct the flow. So we can solve the uh, like turbulent flows with the, this, this approach. And we are confirming that in the end, it was coming from the synthetic truth data simulation. We can reproduce it with pins. What's going on at these scales is more like an interpolation uh, problems with the data, really the, the physics of the problem ends in this dashed line over here. 
So as we wrote to do with synthetic data, we said, let's do it with experimental data as well. And so we grab particle tracking uh, velocimetry data from their experiments. And of course, now we don't have a really a truth to compare with, but we can compare again with their method and we got reasonable results as well, uh, both in the velocity and this is a, um, the, um, sorry, the vorticity and in the pressure spectra. So we can see again, our predict the prediction coming from pins are sm uh, smoother than the ones from CCM. So, but then we're able to realize, okay, what's going on in the spectra? In some scales, both methods uh, predict the same, but in our scales, the energy content of uh, one method is stronger to the other. And what we think now is that this energy content is all this noise that we're seeing, all this uh, fluctuation that we see in this, um, in this method compared to the more smooth out uh, pin method. So one smooth out of it and the air adds noise and then it's always finding a balance of how to uh, do it, but we can use it for experimental data and then so the experimentalists can go and then measure the things they want out of their experiment. Let's just perform uh, fun reconstructions in that experiments. And to finalize, what I have here is, uh, as I was saying, previously we always, we always have data, maybe partial data, partial in scales or missing, say, pressure information and really having velocity information. But it was always data was resolved in time. And, well, the, the snapshots were not resolved in time, but we knew we, we had a lot of information on one particular realization, one snapshot. Here, what the problem was, there was a the experimental group here in Buenos Aires. They were doing measurements at a wind tunnel, and they only had a hot wire at the moment. They only so they could only get a signal at a given point. Of course, they could change the hot wire, they move it, but of course, when they move in and rerun the experiment, the the data coming from one point and the other is not correlated. So you can only look at the statistics of that flow, but you cannot really look at one particular realization of that data. So they had this data coming from wind tunnels and they wanted to reconstruct it. They wanted to generate a field that was compatible with their observations because they wanted to perform some simulations and ask some questions about that, um, that flow. So not just measure something, but put that in the computer and ask the, uh, some numerical questions about it. But they're saying, okay, how do we generate a field that is turbulent and is compatible with the observations we're seeing? And so it's not really a reconstruction problem because we cannot reconstruct that particular realization, but we want to have something that is compatible with observations they present. In particular, the, the main observation they had was that the flows had a lot of skew skewness. They were like the, the distributions were like <laughs> to one side. And that's not very common homogeneous isotropic flows. And it wasn't very clear either how to just add a term to the equation that would uh, uh, mimic that. Because the problem we have was a wind tunnel with an active grid. So they had all these flaps in the system going uh, up and down, up and down. And that generates a very particular kind of flow, which is very hard to model because you have flaps going, uh, opening and closing. Um, they just knew, okay, we just measure this and close to the flaps, the flow has a lot of uh, skewness. So it's, we thought, okay, this is a data simulation problem in a way. Let's try to generate a field that is compatible with the, the data. So what we said is, let's add a, first a seed uh, field, something to, to, to chew on will be a, in this case, a, will be a homogeneous isotropic flow. We start as a seed. This will all, all done with pins. We let us this physical regularization. So we want that to be close to the equations of motion, even though they may not be the perfect equation of motion, the clearly we're not modeling the flaws, but at least the, the idea that's a nonlinear term, a temporal evolution, a pressure gradient, all connected to error, it's there. And then we'll add another term to the loss function, we'll see the observation we want to, to, to enforce. And indeed, if everyone familiar with uh, variational assimil data simulation methods, this is the, um, the, the state variables that you measure, the, the evolution of the system, and then they observe, it will be like the observation operator. So here is a, we, we take, the, this is now not a point by point loss as here, it's a, we take the outputs of the network and do the, um, compare their uh, third order, uh, third uh, order moment with the measurement that we have. So we want to move the whole, the skewness of the whole prediction towards what we're seeing. So it's really a uh, loss on the on a mean uh, on an average quantity of the um, of the pin, not of a point by point loss, but as sent with data and the process. 
sorry, uh, that was a, an extra slide. Uh, no, let me go to this one. I was talking about the you know the, uh, the skewness. So with this, so we did that. We had that seed, the physics informed term, and the skewness that we wanted to reproduce, or the third order moment. And then the seed was first a uh, seed coming from a homogeneous isotropic simulation. So we just generated a flow in the computer that we knew it did not comply with the statistics that we were observing, but we used that first and we started to train the network. So it learns the flow, it learns it, it's close to another stocks and it starts to impose the students. So here the students at the beginning is uh, uh, first is zero because the network is not initialized. Then once it's initialized, the students are predicted is the one coming from the seed simulation, which is has this value. And then what we did is once we, that was converged, we swapped the seed for the output of the network. So okay, we have a one state and this do like an iterative process. So we take that find the state of the network and use that now as data. So we replace this seed with something that was trained up until this point, and we start training again. And we see that the loss starts going down again. And when that happens, the skewness goes up because we our seed now is a bit closer to the actual observed uh, thing. So we can move step by step. We do that a bit, and then we do a change it again. Let's change the seed value again. And we do it a few times, and every time we do that, the system is able to get closer to the observed skewness uh, of the problem because we have a seed that's getting closer to that, but we're still retaining some memory of that original flow. So both the seed and especially the physical realization ensure that the field we are preparing stays reasonable. But because of course you can just generate a skewed distribution that has the, the statistics that you want but it's not anything physical. But here, the flow, we can see the this uh, profile at the different times we are uh, reconstructing here. Uh, so at, at, each, at each different iteration. So we can see that the flow starts, never deviates that much from what we see. So it's a flow that's fluid-like and turbulent while attaining the, the observation that we want. So now we were to generate something that was compatible with the observation that we saw the lab, and compatible to some error with the equations of motion and what a turbulent flow looks like. So then we can go and ask numerous do simulations with that data, which is a little, basically as it's at the wind tunnel, they want to let the data decay and see, okay, what's what's going on? How does the turbulence evolve? But that you have a you have to first have an initial condition prepared somewhere. And so finally, to tie everything up. The point that the one final problem we're having with this is that, um, okay, pins are nice, but they can be sometimes hard to scale up. And this, if they want, they wanted something quite turbulent for this uh, wind tunnel. And we're working first with this. And the what we could put in the GPUs we had at hand wasn't that big. So we have to upscale the problem because we had a original seed field that wasn't very well resolved and a pin prepare field that. Uh, is turbulent, but it's not very turbulent. We wanted ways to upscale this, have something that's more turbulent because as uh, they're having the, the simulation to wind tunnel, we wanted something of not only complying with the statistics, it had to be turbulent. So we could have done that by just making the pins uh, then when there was bigger, so they would have to have the capacity to have more scales in the problem, or at least start chopping up the domain. We did a bit of that actually. Chop up the domain to have networks for different parts of the domain and in the whole would be then a bigger scale problem. That would have been one way. Another way that's very, uh, it's getting a lot of structure in this day use a sort of super resolution method or it takes, for example, a gun or something of an under resolved field and have the gun uh, output smaller scales of that system. That would have been one way, but I would need to train a network and all. And we said, okay, we'll, we can do nudging too because we we have a field that on the large scale has the statistics that we want, and we already have very nice uh, classical solvers that can solve your stocks with zero special methods, and they are fast and parallelizable. And we know they are they have put uh, numerical conversions. So let's use nudging to upscale our solution. So uh, out of the seed field, we pre pin prepared a field that has the correct statistics, and then we use that to nudge. A much bigger simulation. So here we have in gray the uh, scales that are notched, while there's a whole spectrum, the whole spectrum that we have. 
and this is the final upscale field. So and this is for but basically what we can have this way something that as we on the large scale we can retain the state observations that we wanted, but while generating small scales that are compatible with those uh, large scale observations and make the problem much more turbulent. In a I would say a much more straightforward way than going about with just uh, more neural networks to the problem. So go back and say, Professor, okay, what are the classical tools that we had at our disposal that um, we're going to can, can help us with this problem? And we went back to yeah, the classical numerical methods in order to upscale the resolution. Uh, and that's uh, and yeah, the so now that we're prepared to field, we're working on the next step, which is as I was saying, analyze what's going on in the in the wind tunnel. But that's a that serves as a motivation of a, a method to generate fields with a given observation uh, with pins and and the drain. And I think that's it. Then uh, that's uh, all I wanted to show you. Thanks for listening. I knew I was talking very fast and just being a lot out. And I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Patricio. So, any questions from the audience? I wonder, uh, my name is Artem, Artem Kolachenka. Uh, I work with solid mechanics. Um, and thank you for the interesting presentation. I wonder how do you include the uh, boundary conditions in, in your uh, in your pin uh, approach. In one slide, you show the schematics of the approach. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you can elaborate on how you do yeah. the boundary approach. Yeah, here. So in, in a way, actually, we didn't. Uh, so take, for example, this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the channel flow data where the boundary condition at the bottom is the no slip condition where a flow cannot uh, move uh, when it's touching a wall. That we added by just saying that at the adding an extra, so if you have the last function uh, here, will be an extra term that's u at the bottom has to be zero. But then I will really, uh, the domains were like reconstructed, so that's uh, here. But the domains we're trying to reconstruct over here, that these boundary conditions over here is not really like a, free surface or a boundary condition we can really write in a nice way, not even periodic. It's just a, a chunk of fluid in the middle of a much bigger flow. So the boundary conditions will be like sort of theoretical conditions with this uh, given data. So in a way we will just like not care about it that much because we, we have all our information is very well resolved in the center, in the bulk of the flow. So we have in our whole domain, we have information in the center and the boundary, con some points will lie close to the boundary and that would be it. But in a way, we don't really need the information at the boundary uh, in this problem because we have all the information in the bulk for the domain. And by bulk, I mean, not just in space, but in time. So we have, not we have initial condition and boundary conditions where we evolve those systems of equations. We have different measurements at different times. So we can propagate that information from inside the domain in a way. That's also, as we don't have the, boundary conditions well defined that's why we have in this uh, close to the top of the uh, of the domain our errors are a bit larger that's mm. always because over there we don't have as many data points close to that that's that's a problem so we are in if you're in the center of the domain you have data points all around you if you're at the boundary domain you only have data points to one side but um, as it's really just a regression loss on a bounded domain, we don't really need the boundary conditions as safe for solving a PDE directly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. More questions. <clears throat> I actually have a curiosity uh, mm -hmm. about the part where you use the GANs for filling in the gaps, which I think is quite interesting. Have you tried transformers for that? No, no. When we tried the the gun thing, it was a few transformers were near. I think probably in the computer science community, transformers were already a thing, but it hadn't spilled over into the scientific machine learning communities a few years back. And uh, now we haven't uh, yet uh, gone back to that problem. Uh, so we finished that, and then I moved on to the the pins. But probably once we if we go back to that gun uh, like that generator problem. We'll try, uh, we'll try a transformer as well. We have done sensing in turbulence, both with CNNs mm -hmm. and GANs, 
and now we're doing with transformers and there is quite some uh, interesting potential for transformers oh, they, oh good good to know then, get, then we'll definitely yeah, yeah i think it's worth trying and of course we can discuss if you're interested in in that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, for the moment yeah we, we finished that one we now uh, went back but we, I, I may next year do something similar so i'll, I'll keep it uh keep it in mind Cool. And another uh, point that I had was uh, with the pins. I think that is interesting. Uh, could you comment uh, on two things? First, on the computational cost of pins uh, with respect to a traditional uh, numerical solver of the, of the PDE. And second, yeah. whether you do unsteady, um, unsteady pins. So, yeah, all, all the both examples I was using with pins. It's a flows that are like uh, it's full in so situation. They are unsteady. Uh, How do you treat uh, the time? Yeah, yeah. It's a time is included. This is a flow that has several throw through time. So there's very much a. Uh, right, but I mean, uh, how do you treat the time? Uh, it's just another point. In a, it's a, the, the same way I, I evaluate in X, Y, or Z. I evaluate at certain T's. I have the, the information on the tracks at different times, and I just uh, evaluate on those. Uh, in a fully connected way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just, okay. uh, it's all input for me. Like uh, X or T in a way, don't, don't, we don't really differentiate them uh, as, as we in how we treat them. It's just we have, a special um, temporal point. Yeah. We have taken uh, recurrent networks and things like that for a time. Uh, yeah. Because with longer time sequences, that approach with a fully connected can be problematic. But uh, yeah. but it means that it works well for you, so that's nice. But with a recurrent uh, approach, I think that it kind of works nicely as well. Yeah, I've seen, uh, especially when, because the, the thing here is we're not really trying to solve the equation as we have an initial condition and try to merge that on time. Uh, here we have points all around our domain, so it's really more of like a regression problem where you have points in different at different times and different uh, x's. So in a way, it, it does make sense to have a, just a fully connected network there, while if you are just merging uh, a solution there, uh, I, I can see a, a recurrent network or something like that really coming in hand because you're really going forward in time out of something you uh, learned first. Well, but you here, have um, uh, an unsteady term in your governing yeah. equation, which means that you need information at several time steps. Okay. Not to, to evaluate that unsteady term in your governing yeah, yeah. equation. So it could be that uh, with more, I guess you're taking two steps now, you're doing a very simple first order finite difference, but it could be that um, if you take more steps and then you introduce some recurrent network or something, it might be that you can exploit the temporal information better. Uh, at least that has been for us in some problems, but it depends on the problem, of course. Okay, I'll, I'll check it out then. Yeah. yeah here, as, as we have the data in, in time and space, we, we have a, we know our horizon already. Mm -hmm. I think that that may be compared to just solving a PDE. Because as you were saying, the computational costs. That was my other question, yes. Yeah. So I can say the computational cost, of, for example, the PIN method compared to the other method for reconstruction, PINs are much faster. Uh, we were doing before with just like interpolation and integrating the pressure. Uh, we were considerably faster running both on GPU. So uh, more like a apples to apples comparison. If I go into the turbulent case and compare a pin to a zero spectral parallelized solver, uh, I, I don't think pins really stand a chance in that regard. Yeah. Not just right. because of yeah. them, because uh, as I was saying, running a simulation with all these scale separations on a pin, the, the one I have here, I, I at least don't know how to do it uh, right now very well. You have to like really parallelize the domain a lot and uh, use several GPUs, but this with 20 CPUs, I can do it in in an hour. And with GPUs, I think it would be much harder to do pins this way. So that's why what I was using the pin here was more for the inverse problem, where again, I want to generate something. I have some data, but I don't have it all. And it took a few hours on the GPU. So it's something I could not do with the normal solver. But once I, I had something I could do with the normal solver that I already knew how to work, that I, we, have, we had optimized for years and years, uh, and we we know how to parallelize very well and everything, and we know how to the the errors and other reads if we have good estimates. Uh, it's just just that maybe in a few years it will be that that um, that answer will have a that question will have a different answer. But right that now, for, consistent, the uh, actual, uh, actually solving Navier-Stokes on a periodic domain, 
mm -hmm. the there's no real uh, in a very turbulent regime i would go with the classical solver absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah that's what we have seen of course, pins helps you when you have a very very sparse and disorganized mesh uh, then you yeah. can get something from it yep. yeah yeah okay. here the, the mesh is super regular so we are not really having that advantage of pins here yeah, exactly. Exactly. We, we have it more on the optimization problem like being able to frame our problem as an optimization problem that's what we gain but otherwise then we just go back to the grid yeah cool very good uh more questions hmm. hello patricio i'm Hi. luca <laughs> um Hope you're good, doing good. Uh, I just had a question. Like now, you you in the last slides you were talking about both super resolutions and uh, yeah. nudging. But uh, let's say, uh, can you just made a little bit of a case, like whether when you would use which uh, tool in a sense? So it's a it's a good question. So yeah, here as, as we were saying, and it's connected to Ricardo's last question. We had this prediction coming from pins that complied with some of it, but wanted to have more resolution, uh, which we couldn't do that with just by going hard on more pins. So we, as we already solving uh, season of work, sold in, in all of time and space, we already have the whole field in 3D and in time. So it was really something that was very easy for me to go and, in, uh, and put in the nudging equations because I have something that is already very much compatible with with this, I can take the real, I, I can use it easily. And it was resolved in space too, because these are 3D simulations. If I had only a snapshot of my problem similar to the GAN, as I was showing before, then I would go for a super resolution method because I have their information that is harder for me to put into this, uh, in, into this problem. Or, or I cannot take the real tips of that information. I cannot do certain things. So I may have to rely on something more image driven. Um, well, if you got something that can be casted into the uh, more dynamical uh, problem, then you can go with uh, quite something like nudging. Uh, yeah, it would depend on yeah, what data you have. Okay, okay. Now that, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah, because like typically you have either 2D like slice instead of adding yeah. the full field. So of course, like sometimes super resolution methods can be more effective. But of yeah, course- Yeah, no, like, they're in, uh, I agree, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. More questions? OK. If not, then uh, we would like to thank once again the speaker. Thank you, Patricio. Thank you for joining thank us virtually. Hopefully, you can join us in person at KTH uh, in the near future. Uh, I and then, uh, yeah, we will post your um, recording in KTH uh, Play, so everybody from the thematic area can access it. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. We stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.